Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Benshee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How did I, Joel? Refreshed after the Easter weekend. Yeah, we're recording on the Tuesday. We've just come yeah. off four days of uh, not doing a lot besides eating chocolates and Easter buns. Yeah, yeah. Well, I drove, we went down to my dad's place for the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, so a bit of a road trip um, and horrible, horrible traffic on the way home. Yeah, that's the case in Perth, yeah. Yeah, this was like worse than than I think I've ever seen it. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if we just managed to hit the worst of it um, this time or if it's because people aren't travelling outside of the state um, where they would have previously. Um, yeah, I don't know. A confluence of variables probably. Yeah. Well, I'm three days into solo parenting. Oh, man. I know. It, the kids, I believe, are still alive um, and nourished. Well, there's one of them's here, so we know for sure that he's alive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found a great plot, babysitter. Um, the office. PS4. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Um, that's keeping him entertained. He, he had to do some homework today as well and, and go for a run with dad. But besides that, you know, he's keeping himself pretty entertained, I think, living yeah. his best life. Oh, why not? It's school holidays. It's for for doing stuff like that. Yeah. you got to be a kid, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, but look, we've got a very cool guest from the UK. Yes. It's the beginning of the day for her. She's yes. nice and fresh. I believe she's onto her third cup of tea. Mm-hmm. So we should probably introduce her in. Again. Again. Yeah. Oh, you've just given it away, Joel. Uh, well, no, I don't think that's given it away. <laughs> okay. Well, look, she is the second person to appear for a second time as a solo guest on the podcast. She is a chartered psychologist with over two decades of experience. She is an autistic ADHD woman whose current work focuses on both psych health and safety and diversity and inclusion, which makes her the perfect person to talk to on today's topic. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Jackie Wilmshurst. Thank you and hello. It's great to be back. And it's great to have you back on. Now, you were one of the esteemed few that made it on our Christmas replay list, Jackie. So much did we love your uh, the conversation that we had with you on that podcast episode. So it uh, is great to come have you back and, and talk about a different topic today. It's really, really good to be back. Um, so our... Uh... Our normal two questions, Jackie, before we get into it. Um, What podcasts are you listening to at the moment? Oh, see, this will be topical a little bit later on around neurodiversity in that I'm not much of a listener. I like to read. Mm. So um, I wouldn't really have anything much going on there, but I have got a lot of books on the go. What are are your top two? Top two at the moment would be a book on... um, COVID intelligence linked to my wildlife rehab work mm. and a novel I've just started by one of my favorite authors. COVID intelligence is possibly one of the more terrifying things to be reading about, I think. Yeah, <laughs> they may well take over the world. Yes. They haven't already quietly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, I, I'm sorry. I must have missed something. What? Cr- crows. Cor- but it's corvid. Corvid. So corvid. it's like the cl- the class of bird, isn't it? So it's like crows. Yeah, and it's the corvid of- family. Yeah. yeah, they're known as the crow family, but it includes a whole bunch of birds. Not your Australian magpie, but mag- over here it's magpies, carrion crows, hooded crows, jays, uh, ravens, uh, rooks, a whole bunch of different birds that fall in that. But they've got very high levels of intelligence. Okay, and they're not the birds that were featured in the Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock movie. Oh, that the, was a uh, mixture. I think there were gulls in there, but there were some corvids as well, I believe. Yes. Yeah, okay. Probably didn't give them the best press considering they're very actually very interesting. Birds. And is it true that they hold a grudge? They can do, yeah. They've got quite complicated social systems. And they there's a guy in um, Washington State, John Maslow. He's one, like, one of the sort of top experts. And on the campus of the university, I think it's Seattle, but anyway, he's captured crows just to tag them just so that they can continue. And now if he tries to walk through campus, he's tried wearing masks, hoodies, walking differently. He's done everything he can to disguise himself and he can't get near any of the crows, all of whom just peck about and do their normal things when everyone else walks by, but they actually remember him however much he tries to disguise himself as the guy who caught them. So do they, they just avoid him or do they, um, do they take out a grudge on him? They more just avoid him, stay out of his way. But actually on the flip side, a lot of different 
crow family uh, crow species are known to bring gifts to people who feed them regularly mm. i had a bird that um re was regularly sweeping me when i was walking around the oval after my my back operation mm. yeah i uh, took i took a video because it was that reliable that this bird would sweep me i, I started taking like selfie video and i could see yeah, that no, the, the the bird, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Australian magpies are um, demon. But birds. it wasn't a it wasn't a magpie magpie. Wasn't it? Like and like what are those other ones? Like, Mudlark. Oh, I've got no idea. I'm really not an ornithologist at all. Mm. Yeah. It's usually just in nesting season where if you walk yeah. through their territory, they're just sort of warning you off. But no, they uh, look. Oh, it didn't attack everyone that went past, but it attacked no, me very do. reliably. Yeah. You, what you oh, should really? have done is yeah. um, just bring like a handful of um, dog kibble. Yeah. If you feed them then they decide that you're okay. Yeah, it was more fun to let it sweep me. I was wearing a hat. You so, were, yeah, yeah. It was okay. Mm. All right. As interesting <laughs> as that is, <laughs> that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so, Jackie, um, last time you were on, we were talking about um, content moderation, uh, but mm -hmm. this time we're talking about um, neurodiversity. So can you tell us what led you into that field as part of your professional practice? Yes. So, well, a couple of different strands, actually. It, when I was in the military, um, one of my main jobs was education. And I got very, very interested in um, what's now known as learning differences. It used to be talked about as learning difficulties, but broadly, actually, mainly dyslexia. And I was working with a whole load of people, um, mainly men who had joined the military, a lot of whom hadn't had the best experience in school, ended up in the military, ended up really successful. And then they were back on an education course. And I got very interested in how bright many of these guys were but not finding some of the educational stuff easy. And it led me into a strong interest in dyslexia. And I got involved with Sheffield University here in the UK looking at adult dyslexia. And I did used to run assessments and also um, get involved in some of the research on if people haven't been diagnosed in childhood, how does it end up showing itself? Just a whole bunch of things I could talk about, but I got very, and I just naturally had a strong interest. I knew I wasn't personally dyslexic, but I had intuitively a really strong interest in the idea of these diff learning differently. Alongside that, I'd always known right from childhood and school that I just often the way I think about things and learn things and do things is not kind of the norm. I'll come back to what I'm, we know what the norm, not the norm meaning free of any value judgment that normal's best, but just the statistical norm is in that the way schools are designed and workplaces. I've, I've often found myself really challenged and that ultimately led to a lot of reflection. And I took a bit of a sabbatical a few years ago, went around Europe in a motorhome, thought a lot, read a lot. And it was just around the same time that more was coming out in terms of blogs, articles, experiences around particularly women who are, and I'll, I know you're going to ask for neurodivergent, but um, more, more things I could recognize because what the reading I'd been doing previous to that was all centered because of the way the research has been done, centered on boys and men. And I just wasn't reading anything that was really reflective of me. And suddenly I was recognizing things. And that then led me to decide to go for an assessment and ultimately a diagnosis. And therefore that then brought those different things together. And there's also a very strong link with psychological health and safety, which is probably fairly apparent, but I'm happy to say more later. So really all of those different strands have come together such that I do do the work around you know, psychological health and safety at a strategic level and all the things I talked about before. Um, but neurodiversity has come in as a very strong strand, both within that and alongside it. And obviously it's something that I care very deeply about personally. Yeah. And having, having personal experience always helps, um, when you, when you're doing this kind of work. Hmm. So, um, Jackie, there is a lot to explore in this area, but before we get into some of the practic practicalities, can you explain to our listeners what the word neurodiversity means? Yes. So this word was originally coined by someone called Judy Singer who's Australian actually she's an autistic woman who has a sociology background and it was in the mid 90s and she was doing a thesis in a nutshell she was wanting to get a little bit past the idea that there that these um, differences are all um, somehow psychiatric disorders problems pathologies and in studying it part of what she's looking at was this idea that if we took it that this diversity is delib not del well natural um, she liked the idea of biodiversity um, representing ecosystems that when they're healthy, they have the full range of species, animal, plant, vertebrate, non-vertebrate, they have the whole lot. And that the, the greater that diversity for that ecosystem, the more healthy the ecosystem is and that every species is supposed to be there. And they've all got different niches and they've all got different needs and ways of living. So she came up with neurodiversity because she wanted to say, look, what if we saw this as a completely natural variation in the way that brains are wired? 
and that we need that diversity. It's what's made humans successful over the millennia. Um, and so it was really her attempt to, to get the conversations going, but to get some of the thoughts around this diff, to be different. And she's done a very good job of that. Um, so her take on it back then was it's, it's essentially it's a biological fact. And she said neuro because it is all around brain wiring. It's particularly around information processing and communication. Um, there is there is more than that. It's not all about labels. It is about saying, you know, this diversity exists as a biological fact. Um, how do we understand it better and harness it better? What's happened since then is there is now neurodiversity as essentially as a human rights movement alongside a lot of the other groups of people who've needed to have their voices heard better so and, and be included better in, in societies, cultures, care, workplaces, schools. So it's kind of two things at once. Um, and it's important in a way because some people will identify more strongly with the human rights movement and become very strong activists in that. And others will be more just interested, not, not just academically, but just in this sort of fact, essentially, and what we do with it. Yeah, it's uh, as a movement, it's it's definitely picking up a lot of steam. I even saw uh, Richard Branson had petitioned LinkedIn to have uh, dyslexic mm -hmm. thinking as a skill that you could put on your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, there's a lot towards the idea of this. That it's, it's a hot debate as well because it can go too far with people talking about superpowers mm. instead of. But where it, I think the pendulum sometimes swings almost too far before it comes back to the middle. What it was trying to do was to say, let's not focus on everything that's challenging for these for people with these differences, even though those things are important. We do need the right support and understanding, but that usually we've got an equal number of strengths that are, are equally probably not as well understood. And so dyslexic thinking is. Kind of quite well known around sort of lateral thinking creative thinking often coming up with quite left field ideas i've worked um in an engineering faculty with a, a dyslexic uh, engineering professor boss who'd said all his life he felt that it was his dyslexic thinking that allowed him to come up with really really innovative problem solving yeah it was funny because it, it did knowing that you were coming on and and talking to this topic today we did talk a little bit about in the office and it turns out that two our two of our creatives mm. uh, are actually dyslexic so um yeah. you know there you go that more of that creative side of the brain coming out yeah there's a whole there's a lot of neuroscience that's still in the process of being understood better but there's certainly plenty around you know left the, the different hemispheres of the brain and hand, i'm left-handed as well and there's a lot of stuff around the kind of way that the hemispheres of the brain talk to each other and how that can be that can bring about quite a lot of differences yeah yeah no, really interesting so um given you know it's it's getting a lot more airtime um you would think that there's heaps of people have different examples of neurodivergence uh what proportion of the population though are um, neurodivergent so that's an interesting one around statistics because if you if you Google it, you'll get wildly different results because well for lots of reasons. But one of them is that um, a lot of the quite, quite clear statistics are based on diagnosis, and that is sort of the point about it being quite medicalized. Still, it's still something where you kind of have to get a label of a disorder to be able to have a piece of paper that says I'm officially uh, neurodivergent. And that, just another one on terminology. Well, neurodiversity being the diversity like biodiversity that um, those of us who are essentially almost in a minority in that the way whether we have a diagnosis and a label or not but mine happens to be uh, you know, I'm autistic ADHD that it puts us into a minority status basically if we're around a majority of people whose brains work in what they would call neurotypical we are referred to as neurodivergent meaning you know neurodivergent from the norm I do see often and it's one of those where we try it's almost like some of us have very pedantic ways of looking at language, but um, part, partly akin to the traits. But um, one of the things is that people talk about me being neurodiverse. It's like, well, I'm neurodivergent, whereas a group of people could be neurodiverse. And it's it's not the end of the world, but I know some people feel that the language could be better understood. Um, yeah, so then what, what are the more common diagnoses or labels, I guess, for different types of neurodiversity? Yeah. That's also, and I'm sorry, I realized I didn't finish that question, which is yeah. the, the statistics based on diagnosis um, are relatively low. So let's say if you took uh, autism, um, it was sort of down at like 1%. Uh, partly that, partly is an estimate, and but growing all the time. Whereas if you look at estimates based on how many people either don't realize, choose not to get a diagnosis, choose not to declare, choose not to in any way be out there with it, their estimates are growing all the time up to more like sort of 10% and that would just be for uh, autism. If you take neurodiversity as a whole, they're saying it, it gets a bit blurry because you, you end up trying to pin down, well, what, 
what does neurotypical look like? And you realize it's a smaller and smaller and smaller group because a lot of what seems to be the norm is just people conforming. Mm. And that when you really look at it, there's, there's, there's such a breadth. But I think estimates now are saying that if you took the known labels, which you just asked me about, which would be dyslexia, autism, ADHD, dyspraxia. So, well, learning differences get grouped together. So dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, uh, a bunch of their learning seen as learning differences that often are identified in sort of early school days in terms of the styles of the way children learn in those different fields but they are like the point of these uh, things is they're not like mental health conditions where they could fluctuate or they're something that you should be wanting to cure they are literally the way we've arrived and you you can try your best and we might conform but we won't change our fundamental wiring um, there are others that get on the fringe like some say that obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, is a neurodivergence. Many would say, no, for those who have difficulties with that, it's much more around unresolved trauma and, and is something that can be um, essentially fixed in time if the person wants it to be. It's usually quite a distressing mm. um, situation to find themselves in. So, And then there's also things like Tourette's and other things that cause tics. Uh, and within the learning differences, also dyspraxia. So um, those would be the main ones. But as we said, it's not always about labels. Um, it's definitely just about any of us who find ourselves in systems where the way that we process things is not seen as the right way or the best way and we can struggle. So would um, synesthesia be classified as a neurodivergence? Yeah, it's a good question. It's generally seen as kind of a, I don't want to say a trait, but a, uh, Something, I don't want to say symptoms, because that's such medical language, but that something within. So a lot, quite a few autistic people would find that synesthesia is one of the things that go along with it. Um, as a standalone, I, I mean, I guess in my opinion, yeah, probably, because it's not what most people, how most people experience things. And there's different forms of it. So I've always seen numbers as colours. And I didn't know that was unusual, to be quite honest. I just was like, that's what my brain does. It just gives different numbers a colour. And um it's just something I've always, it hasn't occurred to me to tell anyone. And it was only when I was reading about it that it's like, oh, right. It's quite a mild form, really, compared to the way some people have these huge crossovers of their senses. What, yeah. what about colour blindness? Could that, is that neurodivergence? Good question. Honestly, I've not even thought about it. But it, it, I suppose it really is up to how you de decide to define neurodiversity. Yeah. If you're saying it's a biological fact that our brains come in all sorts of different forms and wirings and everything else then something like color blindness if it's seen as well people are born that way and it's not going anywhere then i guess yeah in the broadest yeah definition. it could be a change, it normal. could be yeah it could be because it's um maybe if the definition is about um neurological programming um whereas this is like a, op it's a optic, perception thing it's, isn't it but yeah, it's yeah lack, lack of lack of cones um yeah, yeah color yeah, recepting cones yeah, mm. it's not about the perception that's happening it's, in the brain. Yeah, it's not your brain. It's actually it's not the about processing. Your, yeah, your eyeballs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, good point. So probably wouldn't that would probably be why it wouldn't have been discussed? Um, because you're right, you could widen yeah. it out to all kinds of different things. But this is definitely more about processing of information in the brain, neurologically yeah. and cognitively. Well, Joelle and I would say that there's probably some undiagnosed uh, neurodiversity in the in the office. Mm. So whilst we have a couple of dyslexic people in our creatives. Um, I reckon in our development stack, we've got um, someone who might be on the autistic spectrum, which I think is a huge compliment. And uh, the way he thinks is amazing. Um, and Joel would say that I've got ADHD because uh, I get distracted easily. Um, but I know one of the uh, I know one of the superpowers associated with ADHD, even though we're not using that term superpowers today, mm -hmm. uh, which is the hyper focus. Because my brother was diagnosed as an adult with ADHD, so um, yeah, ah. he likes he's done a lot of reading on it and loves that idea of hyper-focus and he can sit at a poker table at the casino for 12 hours. So for wow. someone for ADHD, you had to concentrate like that for that period of time. Yeah. yeah it's amazing. Mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong actually with, with using the term superpower, you know, for yourself, if you mm. feel that way, where the reason I mentioned it earlier was that especially for young people is sometimes there is slightly undue pressure on them. If they're struggling with, let's say dyslexia, mm. that they're supposed to find their superpowers. And they can end up really, really stressed by it, thinking, well, I, I know I struggle with these things and I'm perfectly fine at these things, but am I supposed to have something that I'm essentially gifted at? And it, it can sometimes cause people to feel an, almost like an extra deficit if they can't find it. But I can, I think the term, when there are things that we feel we excel at, it's, yeah, I think it's just being careful how it's used, if anything. 
Yeah, because I imagine it could come across as quite patronising as well from somebody who sits in that neurotypical um, space to then, you know, refer to your superpowers. I think it's more that, that it can feel mm. a bit, oh, bless you, you've got a wonky brain, but yeah, don't worry, we'll help you find Aren't your superpowers. Aren't you great? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find how you're, you're special. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would we say if, if we're looking at like from an employer's perspective um, and obviously the whole um, DEI um, space is getting a lot more um, interest and, you know, sort of businesses are looking for how they can um, do more in that area. Um, does neurodiversity fit within that? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. So at the moment, there's two main things in the whole I know there's D and I, there's DEI, there's all sorts of different ways of looking yeah. at it. But if you're looking at diversity, meaning that in all the different ways we know about, humans are diverse creatures, and we know that often that diversity hasn't been captured well, that there's the kind of getting people in the door is where I'd put it. So if we're looking at neuro neurodiversity at work, there's two major problems. One of them is not getting the, the full diversity through the door, often not intentional discrimination, just um, all sorts of ways in which it can be hiring practices, it can be with the way jobs are advertised, it could be the kind of impression the company gives. There are lots of things that stop uh, a lot of us who are in what we would call neuro minorities getting in the door in the first place, which is a huge loss for everybody. And there is a statistic about something like 80 percent. I know that the, the actual diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome is gone and, and the idea of high functioning autism is gone. But certainly of those the way it's looked at now is we can be autistic we may or may not have learning disabilities that sit alongside that and those learning disabilities can be what makes it very difficult for people to function and take care of themselves day by day but being autistic in itself um, is this brain difference so those of us who are autistic and you know absolutely fine to take care of ourselves work be out there in life this there's this which would have been the Asperger's diagnosis um, there's this thing that gets thrown around a lot about 80% of um, Asperger's are not in work. And I think that's absolutely not the case. I think there are tons of us in work who just don't tell anyone that we're the way we are uh, or, or who are going undiagnosed. So I do think there's the whole getting employed. And then when those of us who are different do get employed, whether we disclose or we don't, the lack of inclusion can be clearly a huge problem that either means we don't stay in work or we are just miserable and not very productive and that costs us and the company. And then the huge overlap with psychological health and safety, of course, is that if you're, if you're not getting inclusion right, you are not a safe environment psychologically for a huge, potentially quite high percentage of your workforce. So there's the getting us in the door and then there's the keeping us looking after us properly. Yeah. Um, and I imagine it's fairly exhausting um, sort of doing that masking all the time um, in, in a workplace. Yeah, and I know not everyone might know that term. It's probably fairly self-explanatory, but um, there's quite a big thing, particularly about uh, those women who are autistic, that especially when you're a child and you have no idea that your brain is any different than anyone else's, that we are, in our certainly in the culture I've grow, grown up in, girls are taught to be very relational, to you know care about others, to be quite nurturing. We're sort of, it's all around us, but to be that way and to listen well and to do a whole bunch of things that means... We just learned to do it and I didn't realise that I was particularly finding it any harder than anyone else. And actually, there are a whole load of other myths and stereotypes to bust there about how autistic people supposedly lack empathy or can't make eye contact, which is rubbish. It can be the case, but it's certainly not universal. So I wasn't having to mask anything like that. However, um, I did find a lot of aspects of social relationships very, very challenging. And I learned ways around it. I learned a skill set that's very deliberate. And what I found out as an adult, they'll call it sort of, for example, cognitive empathy, where I spend so much time figuring out things that I'm probably way more skilled in some ways than a lot of other people who've never had to think about it in the first place. So um, there's all of that in there really about how we're raised essentially, and then what the cultural messages are and what people think any of these differences are supposed to look like. But masking is definitely where we're having, I'm having to use a massive amount of energy not to seem different because of judgment, because of difficulties and feeling like I have to fit in. Everyone does it to some degree, of course. We all try to fit in in social occasions and try to get it right. So it's not that it will be totally unfamiliar, but it would be more the magnitude of it that day by day having to keep on trying not to put your head above the parapet, really get spotted for being what other people might think is weird or difficult or just inconvenient because you're not the way you do things is not the way most people do them. Mm. So 
In your experience, how well would you say neurodiversity is incorporated into the typical um, DEI discussions and, and processes in organisations? Bad news is not very well. The good news is there's a huge surge in interest and I work um, as a consultant for a couple of different companies helping to get past this just awareness raising or just acceptance into what we mean by actual inclusion, which is very much behavioural behavioral and visual and we know when it's there. You know, I don't want people just to be aware of me and then accept me in whatever way they decided. I want to know that the way I do things is entirely fine. Um, even if I have to articulate what I mean by that, that's fine. So I think there's an awful lot to do in terms of sort of official DEI strategies and policies. At the moment, we broadly get lumped under disability. And that's a contentious field, too, because there's it's a both and not an either or that actually having a diagnosis means that under law I am protected under in the UK it's the Equality Act um, but I'm protected by disability laws by having that diagnosis and actually in the UK if you can demonstrate that you've been significantly impaired on a day-to-day -day basis by the way you are for more than 12 months you qualify as disabled even without a diagnosis so it's an interesting one how you go about demonstrating that but it's very impairment focused but that disability thing, there are many people in who are neurodivergent who would strongly say we identify as disabled, we want to belong to disability resource groups, and we want to have our differences understood as disabilities and accommodated as such. What that leaves is a whole bunch of us, and I'm one of them, who says, I can feel very disabled by my environment. It's that social model of disability that says if I go, I, I liken it with the fact that I'm left-handed, and that if I go in somewhere and they say, we're really pleased to have you representing left-handers because we know there are 10% of left-handers in the world and you're part of that in our company and we welcome you and we're aware of you and we accept you. And then I start doing the job and they say, oh, no, wait, sorry, everything's done right-handed around here. It's just easier. And besides, 90% of people are right-handed. So if you couldn't, don't mind just fitting in with that, that'd be easier for everybody, that I would become disabled by that. And so that model of disability, I'd say, I can get very disabled by not being able to do the things the way I do them. I don't expect to have everything the way I need it all the time, like anyone else, but more understanding. Um, I sometimes feel disabled by my own brain, the kind of ADHD, ADHD bit where I sometimes have 25 tabs open and they're all playing videos at me and I can't quite focus. Um, but actually more often than not, I'd say I like it that neurodiversity can be under a disability category and in its own category that says this diversity is worth its own understanding so that people can really, really get to grips with and, and it helps everybody, by the way, we talk about something called universal design that, to your point, as soon as we start having these conversations, most people just go, yeah, do you know, it doesn't suit me to do a load of things the way we do them around here. I just haven't really said anything, whether it's to do with how we hold meetings, how we exchange information, how we problem solve, any of those things that it benefits everybody when we have a chance to think about it a bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting, I guess, that um, it, it gives us yeah collectively um different angles to approach to um sort of challenge the um maybe the organizational norms um you know that have been around for for decades um where we do have neurodivergent people who can say well here are you know um neurological reasons why we should change this and then that can actually benefit um the broader organization as well so um yeah that's a that's a fantastic point Thinking about um, employment, what do you see as some of the main barriers for neurodi neurodivergent people um, seeking employment? Yeah, also a huge question, as they're, they're all great, fabulous questions and very big. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, I think there's a lot to be done around um, getting us in the doorway. Now, one of the ways that's looked at is things like um, more and more big companies are doing like let's say autism for now, but autism hiring programs. And they absolutely have their place. So one example, and the company is fine to be named in this, but Microsoft um, did a huge, I think they still do, but did a huge sort of autism hiring program. And what they found was, and I, I could say a bit more about how they did it, but the idea was they were very, very careful at making sure that those differences for those candidates were accommodated and understood as they came through the hiring, but they were still fiercely clear that the candidates had to be able to do the job at the end of it but that they didn't want them to get screened out for the wrong reasons. And when they got their successful candidates through the door, they found out that 50% of them had been unsuccessful previously by going through the normal hiring process. 
So they had basically, they had been screened out for the wrong reasons, but weren't about their ability to do the actual job at the end of it all. And that's really common. And it will be the same for other, you know, other neuro minority groups that there are things happening, whereas you said, it's not, usually no malintent whatsoever. It's just that cultures get established, ways of doing things get established. We are mostly quite time poor and we've got to get on. So it's a case of just look, this is just how we do it. Um, but what that can do is really, really screen people out. So examples of that would be, um, as I mentioned right from the very beginning, if I see job adverts, how often you see a diversity and inclusion statement, which is good to see that a company says we are committed to diversity and it often will name, you know, the, the kind of known categories and, and I'll see disability in there, but what I very rarely see is neurodiversity a company making that commitment and saying we've we've actually got it named here because we recognize the importance as a kind of moral obligation but also because it's good for our business and we welcome all of these differences so right from a job advert or, or a company's website there's place to celebrate that and then there's just a lot about job descriptions that can be you know the classic and I've worked a lot with HR teams just anyway on this without the specifically the neurodiversity, neurodiversity focus is that we know we do a lot of copying and pasting. I've been that hiring manager and you're trying to get the right state, you know, the right skill sets in. And um, you get the things like good communication skills and saying, well, what on earth does that mean? I mean, everybody's good, good at nonverbal people can still be great communicators in, the, in a different way. And so it's like, do you, I always want to be a bit of a pain and say, do you, do you mean verbal? Do you mean written? If it is verbal, do you mean eloquence, succinctness? Yeah. It's a, it's a good know, point. It? Joelle can convey a lot with her looks. You <laughs> always know what Joelle's thinking. You mean my facial expressions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not, not well, you know, like hairstyle or anything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we use body language far more than realise, but this idea of just you've got to come into a hiring process and demonstrate good communication skills and think it, some of that will be in your application, some of that will be in your interviews, but some people will actually just stop. There's two things that go on. Either people with differences will screen ourselves out and just think, and this doesn't feel right and it doesn't I don't think I'm going to meet those criteria or it's more that we might get screened out because differences are misunderstood so a classic one again with autistic people in the hiring process can be um eye contact or body language in the room um and being misunderstood as a lack of engagement or just processing speeds and processing styles that you might be trying to hire someone to do a highly technical job in which they'll spend the majority of the day not speaking to anyone as part of the job itself and then require them to explain themselves in an interview and use verbal skills to explain a job that in the end isn't a verbal job at all. So there are loads of ways people get pushed out that way as well. Um, and then there's other things around just the way hiring can be done. You know, is communication clear and timely in between interviews or are you leaving people hanging? And some people's the uncertainty. It can, again, a lot of this can happen to anyone, but what will happen with, again, as an autistic person, Lack of information can send my brain into essentially almost a short circuit. It really is. I used to wonder why on earth that was happening to me. And now I've had to accept that it's not in my control. It's not really a psychological thing. It's, it's quite physical. I, can, um, I can't explain it. And I can't at the time use rationale to say to myself, it's fine. You'll get the information when you get it. There's something that actually happens. And it turns out to be quite a well-known autistic trait. But, you know, a lack of information can cause all sorts of problems. So there's just loads of ways in which things you know, the way things are done can trip us up, basically. But as I said before, if you advertise jobs very clearly and you make commitments to people and you communicate, like, there's nobody that loses out through that in the end. That's why they call it universal design. Yeah, thank you for that. That's um, some really, yeah, some really interesting points there. Um, yeah, sort of, I, I, I guess I was thinking more about the, the interview process itself and um, the, yeah, some of the... Um, the, the, the misperceptions, I guess, um, that the interview panel would be um, interpreting. But yeah, thinking about even from the, the initial application process and the signaling um, that comes through in, in the job ads and that sort of thing as well. So um, yeah, that was a very comprehensive um, summary. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Now, Jackie, I reckon um, with this next question, you could probably go on for half an hour. So I'm going to restrict you a little bit. Um, if we think about the benefits of a neurodiverse workforce, you could probably list dozens and dozens. Um, maybe what are your top three benefits? I think you're quite right to restrict me. You see, this is a <laughs> hyperverbal hyper <laughs> by speaking. Um, so I'd say, uh, well, best for business. But if you, 
the recruit and make comfortable the most diverse range of thinking styles, you're going to get incredible innovation, incredible outputs and incredibly successful business. And um, what's not to like, there is effort required um, to think differently, to look at things differently for sure in the short term, but that's just brilliant business. And we know this from, talked about Richard Branson, and different, many, many people who are neurodivergent have ended up going their own way. I run my own business now. And I, I think workplaces are really missing out, to be honest. Um, another would be, yeah, the sort of moral human rights bit that says a lot of us have spent a huge amount of our lives having to explain ourselves, being misunderstood, suffering, strong links with anxiety, depression, um, changing jobs a lot, just having a really rubbish time. And that it's obviously just looking after your workforce has got to be a good thing, right? And that's the psychological health and safety bit. Um, I mean, really, you gave me three, but broadly, I think the two, because I could say a third one would be legal compliance with, you know, mm. legis- you know, disability law. But yeah, great. But actually, if you get those first two, the, the other one comes with it, really. Yeah, because I found um, it's been great working in the startup that we've got, right? Whereas before, in previous roles, I'd work with, you know, other psychologists pretty much, you know, to a fault. Um, and there's some pretty siloed thinking in that. But um, mm-hmm. having a diversification of skill sets. So now we work with creatives, we work with software developers, we work with commercial and finance people, we work with, um, you know, branding and marketing people and salespeople. There's like, you know, all of these different skill sets coming together. It's actually really fascinating um, what you can do. But then adding in the neurodivergence. So, you know, like I said, we found out we've got a couple of dyslexic people in. I'm really sure we've got someone who's on the autism spectrum. <laughs> Maybe I've got ADHD that's undiagnosed. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing the melting pot and um, yeah, the creativity and the improved product, I guess, is, is at the end of the day is what we're um, about. So it's, um, yeah, all those skill sets come in and, and add something different. But I think also yeah. that um, we've got the, I guess, the freedom to have those um, those discussions or disagreements about things and to sort of air different views um, and really pull something apart to get to the best um, solution, um, having, having that um, diversity of input as well. Yeah, yeah. And we probably do have way too much psychological safety, as we've mentioned before um, on this podcast people are a little bit too free <laughs> in this office to say what they think i think there's a balance there should be more right. repercussions i think yeah, yeah no, i don't i don't think you really believe that <laughs> no, i wouldn't have it any other way it's no. great it's a great place to work it does for anyone anyone looking for work we're hiring yeah <laughs> it does link though with what i was saying earlier that whilst it's really important that we do have good inclusion and um we all do get to bring as much of our strengths and true selves as possible. I also point out though, none of us get what we need all, all of what we need all of the time. And just because I may have a label and be in a minority in that way, it still doesn't mean everyone needs to bend to my way of doing things. I'm very realistic, but just says all I'm after is a bit more, a bit more understanding and inclusion. So there, there's some great real, your point on siloed thinking. What I find in large companies is let's say, and I certainly won't name any names, in the tech sector, that's, that's pretty broad. Um, you may have, functions within there where there's huge amounts of creativity and innovation um, in particular professional areas and they do get to go and do all the blue sky thinking and whiteboarding but let's say I join and I'm sitting within HR there can be professional silos where um, the way HR departments often run are very policy very you know very process orientated and I can find myself the way I work really getting into trouble uh, you know, within a company, it's not the company at large that isn't, a com- you know, bringing in a huge diversity. It's it's my function, and that it's seen as, oh, this is how we do things. We write policies, we implement them, you know, we review them, rather than, you know, I, I like a whiteboard and a great, good verbal discussion. And as I found out, as it was only an adult that I found out, got very poor auditory processing, terrible. I used to wonder why I couldn't deal with lectures. I think it was partly the ADHD thing because I don't sit still for long, but. Um, I actually just don't absorb information that way easily at all. I always say there's an irony because I'm high, I'm like hyperverbal and I love to talk to people. <laughs> I have to make a really, I do listen well because I've made it a skill, but, um, and I'll do it for the sake of relationships and that I care about people. So I will listen and listen in that respect. But if it's absorbing information that I need for work, 
um, I won't absorb it well if it's auditory. I need to read or I need to find other ways, you know, it could be videos, but I'll tend to read transcripts on videos rather than just listen. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting. You meant you did mention that before you prefer to read and, and listen. Um, well, I'm, I'm interested because I think this is where the overlap is um, between this neurodiversity topic that we're talking about and psych health and safety. Like you said, as a neurodivergent woman yourself, um, you are not disabled, but you can be disabled by your environment. So it's a systemic or work design cause of the mm -hmm. disability. Um, so really, you know, in psych health and safety, as you're very aware, um, we're really trying to identify what are the systems that are causing people potential harm. Um, yep. So if we think about what can a um, employer do during an, various stages of the employee life cycle, uh, systemically, to be able to cater towards people who are neurodivergent, you know, what would some of those things be? So if we think about recruitment, and um, I guess Joel touched on that a bit as well at the time of um, interview, for example, you know, what are some of the systemic things um, that could be done or environmental things that could be done to make sure that someone who is neurodivergent is not discriminated, but, you know, feels more able to bring their best selves to that process? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so some of it can happen systemically and then so much of it, the actual sort of behavioural bit is in, in the human relating. Um, but yes, of course, everything. So I think you're right. I won't repeat everything I'd said, but really clear statements around having an interest in neurodiversity, not just, you know, under a disability category, that too, but to say we, we appreciate there's a huge diversity of brain wiring, there's a huge diversity of thought, we, well, we want it, we want it in the door and we want to take good care of people. And then making sure that the way processes work aren't causing huge discomfort or screening people out. And so the thing called universal design is where a company doesn't have to know individual needs to be able to say, some of our processes, some of our ways of doing things that have been done for a long time or established based on people's professional training in what a recruitment process is supposed to look like, might be screening people out or causing huge discomfort. And there are loads of examples and I talked about some of them. And then I think, you know, also onboarding, there are loads of ways the company can demonstrate at that level. You know, we have a culture in which you should not ever feel ashamed if your brain works a bit differently or you communicate a bit differently. And access to, so the universal design can go so far in terms of an environment in which difference is celebrated actively. And it really is meant like that left-handed example where you don't get in the door and then realize you've actually got to be right-handed now you're there, that all the celebration was just sort of, you know almost smoke and mirrors um there's that but then there is the making sure that individual employees because ultimately a lot of our working day is just relating to other humans that there is enough awareness and that's the education piece enough awareness and understanding but also enough time and resource because one of the biggest barriers is people being time poor and stressed and we all know that when we're time poor and stressed we don't have as much space for difference I'm the same as everyone else in that, you know, we can get impatient, we can just want things to work quickly and efficiently. And I think a lot of businesses, there's, there's a huge amount of pressure, particularly on managers, just to get things done um, and not to have the space to actually take some interest. And I think that goes well beyond neurodiversity. You know, a lot of managers are finding it increasingly difficult just to hear employees talk about challenges they're facing at, at home, you know, um, all sorts of stuff you've probably talked about. So I think the systemic stuff is a lot of culture about having the right processes in place, but a lot of it is um, individuals being able to be curious. The, the thing I say often is just being curious. So an example might be, um, there's a bit about performance management that if someone's failing to meet actual output targets, then fine, that's a problem, right? And you do have to look at how come that's happening. But a lot of performance management I've seen isn't about outcomes. It's about the way somebody's doing something and somebody not liking it. You know, like, well, yeah, but that's not how we do things around here. It could be a heavy, um, heavy need for written documents. It could be a heavy need for certain types of meetings. And that actually what's happening is people can, I know I can produce outputs fine, but I sometimes go about it in a way that may not feel completely convenient to people. And it's sort of people are having to almost pause and listen to me and realize that I might need an extra conversation where everyone else or others can go away and sit on their laptops and do it quietly. And um, if that's not accommodated, everybody loses because it's not actually my ability to do the job. It's just a load of assumptions about how to achieve that end, if that makes sense. So, again, that looks different for different people. But I think for if the universal divide design is done better then a lot of people, including maybe me, I might not even say what my differences are. 
um, because I'll just be able to be me and just do things the way I do them and it not be a big deal. That only ever goes so far. And what's left then is that if I do want to raise my hand and essentially say, look, I, I've got a diagnosis, I've chosen to share it. Uh, there has to then be room for particular accommodations for me, something that maybe isn't covered. It could be the space I work in. It could be hybrid working. It could be whatever it takes to say, look, tell me what you need out of me. And that's my obligation to produce that. But can we talk about how I get there? Yeah, I can imagine there'd be um, more room for, um, I guess, universal design or, you know, catering to individuals um, differences um, in, in certain roles, right? Like you say, mm -hmm. in some professions or like uh, uh, professions like HR, for example, like you say, that's kind of like, this is how we do things. There'd be less opportunity or scope to, to change the way that work is done to suit yeah. certain individuals. And yeah. in which case you have people like yourself then who go, well, <laughs> I'm just going to buck the trend and do things my own way in my own company. Yeah, exactly that. And I mean, I also know I, I when I'd not long been diagnosed and I was just interested, I'd seen there were a couple of really big consultancies um, specifically dedicated to helping autistic people get work. And it's brilliant. And I'm really glad they're out there doing what they're doing. But what, we, and I think things have moved on a bit. This was only about four or five years ago. I called up and said, first said, I'm a psychologist. I work in employee wellbeing. I work in diversity inclusion. I work in these places. Really interested in what you do. They told me what they do. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm also autistic and I'd be really interested to know whether you might help me find a more neurodiversity friendly employer um, for a future role. And there was just silence on the end of the phone. And eventually she's like, oh, no, I we don't no, We just put people in tech roles. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically guys in yeah. tech roles who, you know, and, and yeah. don't get me wrong. I don't want to knock the fact that you've got to start mm. somewhere. But I just wanted to see it expand that when a woman who's in HR, who's a psychologist, who's actually very verbally, you know, makes like you know, not the stereotype at all, that there was just this completely stunned idea that how could I possibly be looking for help, you know, to find the right employer? And I'd love to see that move. Mm. Yeah, no, that's uh, going to take a fair bit of maturity changing, I think, in the space. Like you said, it's early days. There's a lot of, um, you know, tailwinds behind this at the moment, uh, this movement, but um, still pretty early days. Yeah, the I think the performance management piece um, in particular, I think, is so important because I do see so many people getting, you know, rated down, I guess, on their, you know, their annual performance review or whatever it might be for things that, you know, from my perspective, I would say are, you know, personality related. They're, you know, displaying introverted traits and so they're being told that they're not a team player or they're not aligning with company values that, fantastic nebulous thing um you know so there's just um yeah we, i mean we can get into the drivers for for why organizations want to have people with poorer performance reviews but um that's no it's uh, huge i think performance reviews are not they're not very psychologically healthy a lot of the time anyway for loads of reasons i know that's a whole topic but yeah i mean the most damning thing that ever got said to me in a workplace was well it was on the one hand it's really complimentary but was a boss who said to me um, your outputs are outstanding. We want you to continue to produce the outputs because you're just, you're doing everything and more that we would want you to do. But he said, the only thing is, can you please just not be Jackie? Oh. <laughs> wow. And when I asked him to explain, he just said, oh, it's just the way you go about things. It's just, it's kind of not how we do things around here. And some of it was that if someone were to ask me in a meeting what a problem was, I'll just say, I'm not rude. I've never been told I'm rude. I'm just honest. And what people have sometimes said is, you just sometimes do say the things that no one else is saying for a reason. Maybe being Dutch is neurodiverse because we have a tendency to say it how it is. We don't well, have much of a filter. That's, that's, My German um, friends said the same. They said you, you could just yeah. be German. <laughs> it's cultural. Culture, yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I certainly found that what I think is just a helpful thing to point out because yeah. I don't mind the same back. I'm not particularly defensive. If someone yeah. says, you know, you talk loads, I'm like, yeah, I do. Um, but if I'm <laughs> pointing something out that I think needs to be said because we're getting stuck, it could be a cultural thing. It could be somebody's behavior. I will always say it in what I feel is the most respectful way possible, but I will say it rather than leave it getting in the way and nobody being willing to say. And yes, you could argue that's an autistic trait or all sorts of other things, but it's just that performance bit around, could you produce the outputs, but not in the way you're doing it? And my answer at the time was no, like I can either produce the outputs broadly the way I am doing and have more support to be me, um, 
or you can ask me to conform and you, you won't be getting what you're getting out of me. Yeah. So um, do you have, um, or what, what would be your top um, pieces of advice to share with organisations who are wanting to improve how they engage with neurodivergent employees? I would say to start with, given that there will be way more neurodivergent people in the company than have ever declared it, some may not realise it, as you say, but there'll be plenty of people who've either, whether with a diagnosis or not, know that the way their brain works is, is different. And I'd say the first thing any employer can do is just get really curious about who you've got, create spaces, create channels, create ways to just say, who have we got here? You know, who thinks this way? Who thinks? And there are lots of ways to do it without talking about diagnostic labels, as I said. How do people like to communicate? How do people like to process information? And it may be that a lot of people don't know because we all know there probably isn't still enough, even general personal development. I know working in the mental health space that anything that helps employees gain more self-awareness is always really well received about the things that challenge us, the things that trip us up, the things that help us be better. And this is part of the same really, that every single time I talk to people about their communication styles and preferences, I do see a light come on. And so, or, you know, one coworker in a different company that I'd said about being a verbal communicator and just saying after we run a session, is it okay just to have a five minute verbal debrief? And also when we're planning, I can go through slides, I can put content, I can write documents, but I usually would say, is it okay if we just have a quick talk? Um, actually, you guys give me opportunities to talk before, the, you know, the podcast recording, but there are ways, and interestingly, in asking this of a, of a, a, a sort of younger colleague, she said to me afterwards, I never realized I needed that now I've realized I do mm. um and so she's found that she can ask about elsewhere now and say and not feel bad about it just say look it may be that no one else needs this but is it, is it okay so I think companies getting curious in creating spaces and then probably helping a bit with what they mean by it you know to say look there are a whole different bunch of different there's so many resources available now um to help start those conversations and within teams encouraging managers to find out is the way that we're doing things working well enough for everyone do we have a bit of time to talk about how we exchange information how we, how we problem solve. Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, you know, something like the example that you just gave then, that, that's not a big ask, you know, that's not a, I think, you know, um, organisations might think about, you know, accommodations for neurodivergent people and thinking about, you know, very big and complex um, types of changes that they need to make. Um, whereas something like that, you know, giving a member of your team the opportunity to have a, a verbal debrief, um, that's that's just such a simple thing. Um, yeah. that, a, that a manager can do. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great takeaway that, um, you know, it doesn't all have to be necessarily big complex change. It can really be just making some small tweaks to the way that you um, interact with, with the people that report to you or with your colleagues. Yeah, and not shutting people down for something really simple like that and saying, no, sorry, it's not how we do it around here because that's happened a lot. The only thing I would, there's loads of light touch, there's loads that doesn't cost anything. There are some things we know do, and I appreciate that does require process and budgets and things. It could be noise cancelling headphones, although I once worked in a company with a very well resourced company, but had vending machines that your employee pass, you could, you could just swipe it and get, you can only ever get one item once, but they've got really top end noise cancelling headphones. So got them in fact, really good ones and different keyboards. And you didn't have to ask anyone. You could just get it, but you couldn't You couldn't keep going back and getting more to give to your friends and family. Hmm. Um, the only thing I'd say about the light touch, of course, I, I feel like I want to just give a mention, though, that when it comes to things like, we've said this is early days, but employing um, someone who's nonverbal, then there's a lot more, a lot more required because most organisations would really, really struggle to have somebody really well included who just doesn't speak at all. And of course, there are other reasons other than neurodivergence for people being nonverbal. But um, I know it's the same when um, companies have wanted to employ deaf people, is that there's a lot more to do around just unexamined assumptions about things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think we go pretty close. I think some of our devs would prefer to just communicate through Teams. Well, that's, that, <laughs> that is like we'll literally sit across the partition, but they've just sent me a Teams message. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, whereas I usually throw things in your direction to get well, your attention. Literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. literally. Um. <laughs> not, not heavy items. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I mean, there was a tennis ball once, but um, that wasn't actually... In your direction, was, not at That you. was near me, not, yeah. not, uh, not at me. So, yeah. yeah, and it got your attention, so... <laughs> that, was, that was to cure me of hiccups, and um, unfortunately it worked, but... Um. <laughs> I heard a story that it didn't work, that you just didn't want to tell me. 
then it didn't work. No, it did work. Oh, and it did I, work. I didn't want to tell you that it did work in case you would do it again next time I had hiccups. Yeah, okay. Because they say getting a oh, fright so. is a fright, gets rid of hiccups. So I gave her a fright. I did. <laughs> okay, good. Good to know. Um, hey, uh, Jackie, well, there's a question that we ask uh, everyone at the end of uh, all, all the podcast episodes, but I want to change it for today, um, given the topic. So what are your hopes for the future of neurodiversity in the workplace? I think I probably mostly said it, but I would really like to see. Um, I'm choosing my words carefully because if I say normalizing, I know what I mean. Um, I would so I like this idea of neurotypes, and we're not there yet. Um, I like the idea that if the more we understood it, like personality types, introversion, extroversion, and as you pointed out, Joel, we've even still got a long way to go there. I'm actually an introvert, the fact that I'm verbal and sociable in certain circumstances. But you're right, we're not, we're not doing well at that yet either. But the idea of neurotypes to me is fabulous, just to say, well, we've got all these different neurotypes. There may well be a prevalent way of processing information that would be called neurotypical, but depending on where you go, it might be different. But actually, let's just embrace all of them. But with that, accept that some of us do have challenges that do feel as I said, I know people who feel very, very disabled by their own brains. They have a different experience than I do. And I always want to show respect for that. So I'm certainly not suggesting that we don't still um, look at this as a disability issue as well. And that there are people who struggle hugely day by day and really do want help and support in that way. But I would also love to see it, <coughs> excuse me, that those of us who don't identify that way, there's room for us too, just to celebrate and say, hey, look, this is how I thrive. This is what I like to do. Um, is there just a bit of room, please, to talk about this a bit more, for a bit more curiosity um, and to get those conversations? And because the other thing, particularly in the world of autism, is that traditionally we've been spoken for. We haven't had our voices heard. And there's even been this crossover time that if someone like me is able to be articulate and self-aware, we'll then get told we're not autistic enough or that we can't really be autistic or how did we end up with a diagnosis? So we can get a little bit between a rock and a hard place. So I would certainly like to see that shift. Having said that, I think I am seeing that shift. I think we're in the middle of it. And I think me being on this podcast with you guys is part of it. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's a topic that's come up with a number of our listeners when engaging with them on LinkedIn. So it's great to almost 100 episodes in to finally be talking to someone on this topic and someone as articulate as you from a lived experience. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, do you have some words of advice for listeners who might want to work in that a space of sort of um, improving access for neurodivergent employees? Yeah, there are so many ways to do it. I think so um, because of the whole psychological health and safety, one of the things I'd say is if, if you're in an employed role is that being able to speak up for yourself, self-advocacy, that, that self-advocacy first, but which actually moves things for everybody else. That's a brilliant way to start. The only thing is if your workplace is not yet safe enough uh, for that, that can be very painful to speak up at a time when um, nobody's ready for it. So I do think speaking up if you feel that there, there are enough safe people to talk to, to talk about difference, but actually without necessarily having to disclose, as I said before, is just starting conversations that are much more generally curious about styles, preferences, can get the conversation going in a much safer way. The other thing that we need more of is allies. And again, not, at, not in that, you know, bless you, you've got a disability and we can help, but actually genuinely interested, curious allies who just say, I've got a lot to learn too about this. And I'd love to find out how we can advocate alongside you. And there are more and more allies networks starting up. So where you do have these employee resource groups and companies, we're getting great mixes now. I would like to see more of these groups be neurodiversity specific instead of just in the disability groups, because that is the norm at the moment. I think there's room for more people to say, hey, actually, we'd like to look at this as a whole topic in itself. Um, and then, yeah, I think employers can just get more curious. Yeah, wonderful. Um, good advice there for people who want to be, I think, allies as well. Um, it can be difficult to know where to start and what to do and you know, sort of want to do the wrong thing and then you end up doing nothing because you don't want to do the wrong thing. And yeah, so I can good, see good to have, that yeah, and good, good to have that advice. Things. Yeah. And that there are lots of places online to start having conversations in respectful ways and just ask questions. Mm. 
Jackie, it's uh, been amazing having you on. I think we're going to have to make this an annual occurrence so we get we get Jackie on to talk about a new topic. Very, yep. very different to the previous topic that very, we talked to you very about. Very different, yeah. So uh, you're very, obviously very broad in terms of your subject matter expertise. You're not a one-trick pony. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do think they're very linked, but yeah, thank you. Well, how about we talk about COVID next time? <laughs> <laughs> you might have to start a new podcast for that topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure no, no, I can make that into workplace. Worth it. Worth it. So, psychologists and their odd obsessions. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I think that works. Maybe. Yeah. But um, yeah, Jackie, amazing having you on again. Um, for our listeners who want to learn more about your work in this space, where can they find out more about that? Best place for the neurodiversity stuff for the moment is on LinkedIn. Um, I do have the website for the psychological health and safety work that I do, which is safetyinmind.org. Um, I'm not particularly uh, focusing on neurodiversity in that space, but LinkedIn is definitely a good place to find me. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, Jackie, again, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, we'll be in touch because uh, we, we love chatting with you. Um, and uh, for our listeners, uh, if you would like to be in touch with any of us uh, through LinkedIn, direct messaging is fine. We will accept and and um, and uh, converse with you. And particularly if you want to pick up on this topic, then yeah, definitely reach out to Jackie uh, because Joelle and I are not subject matter experts in this area. Not by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> so Jackie is the one to talk to. Uh, just for those who are interested, we do video these discussions that we have with our amazing guests and we do put them on the Flourish DX uh, YouTube page. So do check that out if you prefer video processing rather than audio processing. Um, and we will also put in some of the great clips from today's episode onto the Flourish DX LinkedIn channel. For those of you who have a short attention span, um, we're catering to all sorts on, on the podcast. So uh, thanks again to our listeners. Thanks again to Jackie. And we'll catch you next episode.